Did you ever consider how weird it is that a reducer, which physically lengthens a telescope by several centimeters, actually shortens its focal length? Or for that matter, how a device only a few centimeters long, a Barlow lens, can actually double, triple, or quadruple the focal length of a telescope? Call me weird, but I often wonder about such things, and if you're like me and you have shared that interest, I've put together this video for you. Let's answer the mystery of how reducer correctors and reducer flatteners work and how Barlow lenses work. And along the way, we'll get a bit clearer understanding of just what exactly our telescopes are doing with light when we capture images, and that understanding may help you to do better at capturing the next image. Let's begin by talking about focal length, and I'll specify from the outset that I'm referring to focal length as it pertains to telescopes and astrophotography. The concept of focal length is a bit different as it pertains to ordinary lenses and regular photography, but that's a topic that's outside the scope of this video, so we're going to leave it alone. NASA, on their website spacemath.gsfc.nasa.gov, defines focal length for educational purposes like this. Focal length is the distance between the center of the aperture and the focal point in space where distant light rays come to a focus. If you are curious about these topics and want to know more about them in depth, I covered them in my videos, What Happens to Light When It Comes Into Focus, and Understanding Focal Length, Trading Speed for Detail. You'll find links to both in this video to the upper right and down in the description. But let's quickly visually explore what this definition means. Here we see a simple, less than perfect diagram of a doublet refractor. That's a refractor with two lenses. Off to the right, we have our deep sky object, or DSO, and our telescope is pointed directly at it. The light the DSO emits is admitted through the first lens, and that's where our focal length begins. The light moves down the body of the telescope, reaches a point of convergence where it crosses over itself and moves out to our secondary lens. The second lens further processes the light by moving back and forth till the light is brought into focus within the image circle. Where it comes into focus is called the focus plane, and the red rectangle at the back of the refractor represents a camera screwed into the telescope where the sensor is directly aligned with the focus plane. So, according to NASA's definition, where the light first makes contact with the refractor to where it makes final contact with the sensor at the focal plane is the focal length. And something very important, which you can see in the diagram, is that focal length is a physical characteristic of the telescope. It is the result of the actual separation or distance between the vertex of the primary lens and the center of the sensor. Now, if I add a reducer to the back of the telescope, I'm actually physically lengthening the telescope. In fact, the telescope that I used for the image at the beginning of this video was an 81mm Williams Optics refractor, and it will be our model for this video. It has a native focal length of 559mm, and the reducer that was screwed into the image train at the back is 61.5 millimeters long. If focal length is only a physical characteristic of the length of a telescope, then adding the reducer should have physically added 61.5 millimeters to the telescope's total focal length for a new focal length of 620.5 millimeters, a substantial increase. After all, with the reducer physically attached to the telescope, the light path, or distance that light must travel from the primary lens to the focal plane, is now longer. But the Williams Optics Reducer actually reduces the focal length by 0.8, drawing it down to 447 millimeters of focal length. Even though the reducer quite literally lengthens the telescope and the path the light must travel from where it enters at the primary lens to where it comes into focus at the focal plane, by 61.5 millimeters, the focal length is shortened to 447 millimeters. So this begs the question, how does the reducer work its magic? This image portrays a refractor without the reducer. The upper portion represents the tail end of the refractor where the secondary lens is. Light enters that lens and is brought into focus, and the image circle then radiates through the image train down to the camera, which is represented by the red block at the bottom of the image. The blue rectangle represents the camera's sensor. As you can see, much of the light in the image circle does not touch the sensor and therefore is not recorded. This happens because the light is spread out, and that's what causes magnification. Focal length essentially spreads out the light, and the longer the focal length, the more it's spread out. If you saw my video, Understanding Focal Length, Trading Speed for Detail, you would have seen me use the analogy of butter and toast to explain what happens to light when it's spread out by focal length. It goes like this. Imagine that light is like a pat of butter, 
and your image circle is like toast. The longer your telescope's focal length, the larger is the piece of toast. When a telescope has a longer focal length, you have to spread the butter around the toast more to cover it all, so you get less butter per square centimeter of toast. The only way to get a bigger pad of butter is to increase the telescope's aperture, but that's a topic for another video. But in this image, we see the light affected by the telescope's full focal length. It's more spread out, and the image produced by that light is larger, but it's also dimmer. This can be advantageous in certain circumstances. A higher focal length allows you to resolve more detail. If you have a camera with pixel sizes adequate to the task, and you take the time to allow the light energy to build up long enough to properly brighten the image. But time is key here. The longer the focal length, the more time you'll have to spend imaging. And the reward is greater detail captured in smaller areas. In this image, we have added a reducer to the telescope, and this physically lengthens the telescope. At the top, the light from the primary lens reaches the secondary lens, represented upper center in the middle illustration, and that lens is used to bring the light into focus. That light travels the additional length added by the reducer to the reducer lens, and there, the light is bent inward to form a tighter image circle. The size of the image circle produced by the telescope is actually reduced, and this has several effects. For one, it's as if you have made the focal length shorter. It's not actually shorter. You have made, you might think of it as, a virtual focal length. Now this concept of virtual focal length is not unique to reducers in the world of telescopy. It is in fact applied quite heavily among schmidt cassegrain telescopes at the secondary mirror, where light reaching it from the primary mirror is heavily spread out on the light's way back to the image circle. And of course, the application of virtual focal length is also used with Barlow lenses, causing a virtual increase in focal length. But we'll set that aside for now and take a look at Barlow lenses in a moment. But in the case of reducers, specifically what happens is the convex lens bends the light cone reaching it from the secondary lens into a tighter cone, and that results in a smaller image at the focus plane. On the left, you can see the smaller image. And I'm sure you'll also notice the image is brighter. Let's go back to our analogy of butter on toast. By reducing the focal length, we've made the slice of toast smaller. We're still working with the same pad of butter, the same amount of light. But with a smaller piece of toast, we can spread it more thickly around. What is physically happening is that there is more light per unit of time to fall into the pixels of your camera sensor. And this produces a brighter image faster, but the image is smaller, so you'll sacrifice ability to resolve fine detail. The image could be blown up to some degree, but as you blow it up, detail will begin to be lost in pixelation, because the pixels of a camera sensor are only so small. The virtual reduction of focal length with the reducer does provide one other advantage. It makes your guiding less sensitive to the effects of seeing. The atmosphere constantly moves about, causing whatever you look at to appear to jiggle, in much the same way that objects underwater might appear to waver about. When the focal length is high, and magnification is high, we see more of the seeing effects. When magnification is low, the seeing effects matter less. So, by reducing the focal length, the telescope becomes a bit more resistant to the effects of seeing. This matters especially on nights of poor seeing. Of course, whether or not you choose to use a high focal length or a low focal length depends on which advantages you want to emphasize and your personal strategies and preferences for shooting images. There isn't any really right or wrong strategy here. It just depends on which approach you want to take. Now the Barlow lens is basically a reducer on opposite day. Because whereas a reducer has a convex lens, the Barlow has a concave lens. Or where a reducer constricts or reduces the lights into a cone, with the small side being at the sensor. A Barlow lens expands the cone of light, with the large side being at the sensor. This is conveyed in the image you are now seeing. Light travels from the primary lens, not shown at the top of the telescope, down to the secondary lens, shown at the back of the refractor telescope, where it is pulled into focus, and then the light travels down to the concave Barlow lens, where it is bent outward, spreading it even further. This allows a Barlow lens to present the effect of doubling the size of the image. However, as we have talked about in many previous videos, everything in photography, including astrophotography, comes at a price. And there are many prices for using a Barlow lens to increase the size of an image. As you can see on the left, the image produced by the Barlow lens is quite dim, Let's go back to our analogy of butter on toast. The Barlow lens does not actually physically increase the length of the telescope, but it increases its virtual focal length. How much that focal length is increased depends on how much the cone of lights is expanded at the base of the sensor. 
Most bottle lenses that I have seen will have the effect of doubling the focal length, though plenty are made that triple, and some are made that do even more than that. But, when you double the focal length, the slice of toast is expanded. However, it is the aperture that determines the size of the butter pat, and since the aperture is not increased while the focal length is increased, you only have the same amount of butter to spread around the toast. So, the butter is getting spread pretty thin. The principle of this is reflected in the image. The light is getting spread around by the Barlow lens an awful lot, and therefore the image produced is dimmer. So, if you use a Barlow lens to produce a larger image, it will take longer to get enough integration time to get a bright, rich image. And while the Barlow lens increases focal length, it doesn't necessarily increase resolution. Only increasing aperture size can increase resolution. So the benefits of using a Barlow lens are somewhat limited. And to my knowledge, astrophotographers who specialize in deep sky objects such as myself tend to avoid them. While astrophotographers who specialize in targets such as the moon and planets may make more use of them. After all, the moon and planets are much brighter and are therefore less affected by the dimming effects. So, when should you use reducers and Barlow lenses and when should you not use them at all? That is a question without a firm answer. It really depends on what you're trying to accomplish and what you're willing to pay, so to speak, in terms of cost versus benefit. If you have time constraints, so you're after a wide field image or shooting a larger target, a reducer is very likely beneficial for you. Also, many reducers have field correcting effects built into them, wherein they flatten images and correct aberrations, especially around toward the edges of an image circle. For some telescopes, these corrections are fairly optional. And for other telescopes, such as Newtonian, such corrections are virtually necessary. So, those factors will have to weigh into your choice. If you're shooting a smaller object, such as a distant galaxy, you may want to maximize the benefits of the focal length and leave out a reducer flattener. Even if you have a model of telescope that very much benefits from corrections, small distant objects will tend to occupy the center of an image circle. And in those areas, the optics of a telescope, even without corrections, are at their best. So when shooting such objects, you may not even find it necessary to consider the benefits of flattening and other corrections. For myself personally, I tend to think of myself as a deep, deep sky imager. I'm usually after small distance objects, such as remote nebulae and even more remote galaxies. So I tend to either avoid the use of a reducer, or if I do use one, it's on a telescope that has the benefits of a high aperture and a very high focal length. That way I'm still getting a high focal length, but with the benefit of a faster focal ratio. For deep sky objects, Barlow lenses are probably something best avoided for a variety of reasons. While they can double or triple the image size, you will not get the benefits of increased aperture. And it is very important that telescopes with high focal lengths have high apertures in order to resolve more detail and gather more light energy. And increasing focal length will also increase the focal ratio or slow the telescope down considerably meaning it will take significantly longer to get enough integration time on a deep sky object if a Barlow lens is used. Further, since increasing focal length amplifies the negative effects of seeing, using a Barlow lens on deep sky objects will further increase the challenges of getting good guiding. By and large, one is not likely to find a Barlow lens useful for deep sky objects. That's not to say that more focal length isn't useful, but increased focal length really, really needs to be combined with increased aperture to reap a real benefit. However, if your objective is shooting the moon and planets, you may very well find a Barlow lens to be very useful, even some of the higher rated like 3x Barlow lenses. Those objects are much brighter, so the dimming effect of a Barlow lens will matter less. And those objects are often imaged at very fast exposure times or even using video modes, decreasing the negative effects of poor seeing. It doesn't eliminate them, but it does decrease them. But I don't really specialize in shooting the moon and planets, so that's outside of my area of expertise. And I don't like giving advice where I don't have experience, so I'm very certain somebody who does spend a lot of time imaging the moon and planets can give much better advice on how to benefit from the use of Barlow lenses. So I'll leave that to them. As always, thank you for watching, and if you have any thoughts, comments, or questions, please leave them in the comments section below. And a deep and heartfelt thank you to all the subscribers and viewers of the Sky Story channel. I'm, I'm still amazed every day at the speed at which this channel is growing. YouTube reports it now growing at around 600 subscribers per month, which for an astrophotography channel means it's growing really fast. Thank you to everybody for your interest. Keep watching because I'm going to aim to keep trying to make two videos per week and always keep them interesting, educational, and informative. But the most important thing is that you learn something and have fun doing astrophotography and studying the stars. Now, 
Have a blast getting out there and shooting the sky.